Hello, Humane Marketers. Sarah Znikroce here. Welcome to another episode of the Humane Marketing Podcast, a place to be for the generation of marketers who cares. This is the show where we talk about marketing your business in a way that feels good to you, is aligned with your values, and also resonates more with your conscious customers because it's not pushy, ethical, and also beautiful. So if you're a regular here, you know that I'm organizing the conversations around the seven P's of humane marketing. And if you're new here and this is your first time, welcome. I'm so excited you're here. You may want to download your one-page marketing plan with the seven P's of humane marketing in the form of a mandala at humane.marketing forward slash one page, the number one and page. So again, humane.marketing forward slash one page. And with that, with no further ado, let's dive into today's conversation. Hi, Tom. So good to see you and hang out with you for a little while to talk all things humane. Like I just said offline, right? That's basically what we're here for. I heard you talking about humane web and I'm like, I got to have him on the podcast. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, and I, likewise, I was excited when you reached out, and I was like, "Huh, humane marketing, like, great, yeah. we're on the same page." Yeah, exactly. So the 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 way well, I've been on your email list for a while, and then obviously when I saw you talking and actually asking readers about how a humane web would look like to them, uh, that's when you got my attention. I'm like, "Yeah, let's talk about this." So. I'm curious, um, what kind of answers did you get to this question when you asked your readers? Yeah, it was really interesting. And it, I mean, we got a lot of enthusiastic responses and it was it was quite mixed. It sort of ranged from people talking about how um, basically like technology should be designed to like respect humans in terms of like their privacy and their safety and um, to make things more accessible in a sort of tangible ways to people with kind of maybe like a more like pie in the sky vision of like a web that is like more personalized and it's actually like like more like fragmented and decentralized rather than this sort of like homogenized big tech kind of internet that that we've come to um and then other people talking about like more like the experience that we have as humans and that actually we, what if it was more, you know, like a garden that you can, or a library, you know, like a place that you can kind of step into and browse calmly, slowly, mindfully, relax into, like find beauty and inspiration rather than it being like this high paced kind of intense experience that much of, much of the internet's become. So it was really interesting just hearing kind of like that breadth of, perspectives on like what that might mean mm, yeah so interesting I, I love this image of either the library or the the garden and why not a library in a garden <laughs> exactly yeah. That'd be even better so what that means to me is yeah you, you said it after like what we're experiencing is something so intense and probably um yeah it's more like the in our face experience where if you are going to a library you're the one in control you're the one who's going to look for information rather than just showing up and everybody's throwing information at you right is, is yeah, that also exactly. what you felt that's what yeah mm -hmm. that that you're really in control of your own journey and and it's your experience for you right. to have and for you to lead rather than mm -hmm. you're kind of entering into these worlds where you're very much kind of led down a path i mean at best guided down a path at worst manipulated you know to perform certain actions um yeah and sort of yeah put people back in the driving seat in control of their own experience um, mm. in more of a conscious way yeah yeah that's so much aligned with humane marketing because it, it in the end pretty much everything on the web 
is some type of marketing now. You know? Yeah. It's like wherever you go, you, you they want you to enter into a funnel and then basically control your mind and control everything you do. So it's, yeah, it's, it's very much the same in terms of humane marketing. It's like, well, in, give the power back to the people, right? And yeah. it seems like it's the same uh, idea here on on humane web. So so was that also your definition if you thought of it before or did you think of even something else um, that you can add here? Yeah, I think I think it was a, a mixture of a mixture of things, but I think I mean the whole exploration and and it's still an exploration to be honest at this stage, but the whole exploration that that some of us at Holgrain are doing into this concept of a humane web really came from sort of a frustration that the internet kind of in the early days did seem like something that was going to be very democratic and, you know, allow people to have a voice and control their own experience and share information with each other and build communities. And, and it has all of that potential. And yet, more and more it feels like this thing where it's like it's it's very much like a domain controlled by these big tech companies and where you know as you say like we're we're manipulated into these funnels it's like it's the web has become a web of funnels <laughs> yeah and you know and and you enter into it kind of almost at your own risk and and it's not an equal relationship you're very much like you're going in on their terms they're doing things behind the scenes to manipulate you that you don't even you're not even aware of there's like legal terms that you're effectively agreeing to just by like visiting a site or using an online service um and then and and then it's like you know there's the also the fallout of like mental health and the fact that actually like yeah the internet should be serving us as humans and yet you have this like huge mental health crisis that's in part related to our relationship with digital technology and the internet and and it's like well something's really wrong here that it's there are like big corporations that are making vast profits out of the web but at the same time that it's not that there's not any good things have come from it for you know most of us that like we all get some benefit from it day to day but like on some level it feels like this is this relationship isn't working like it's unhealthy um so what would it look like if we reimagine that and said, well, okay, let's kind of go back to the beginning, take all of the, <laughs> I guess, take capitalism out of it for a minute and sort of say, well, like, let's just look at it as a technology. Like what? Remind me, Tom, it... what was the name of the, it's escaping me right now. Like when it first started, what did they call it? Um, it some term that I'm um, forgetting right now, but they actually said it, it's a conversation. You know, the web is a conversation. Um, yeah. So, so really, yeah, that's what you're saying. We need to go back to right to to these early days of the internet. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Sort of like today's technology, but with yesterday's principles, maybe. <laughs> yeah. 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 So much so. Yeah. So, so true. It's 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 almost like we've made such a big yeah we lost our way we lost our way it's it's kind of like kids who are given you know the 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 gadget and then they just like lose their way because they're so excited about this gadget and all of, all the things you can do with it and it ends up going the wrong way it ends up going to almost like evil right that's what we've yeah. done with this technology and and or we we can discuss whether it's you and I it's definitely the you know the, there's always money behind it somehow now where yeah. that was not the intent of uh the internet back in the days yeah I think that's the thing that it's there's there's so much potential to make money by manipulating people in a way that you can't really do as easily in a physical environment you know like you like digital technology can kind of capture people but like most of their waking hours, you know, like it's very addictive. You've got your phone with you like all the time. Um, it can ping you and like, you know, pull your attention back in when you start ignoring it in a way that like the physical world can't. And, yeah. and likewise, it's very easy to do like sneaky things in terms of how you, how you manipulate people to perform certain actions or to think a certain way. 
in ways that if you were in a physical environment would be a bit more like I, I think just a bit more tangible for people to sort of see what's going on and think mm, this doesn't feel quite right I'm not sure I want to shop here um, right. um you know and even things like privacy terms you know that you kind of get sort of forced to like click a button to say like I agree before you come in that there's some like giant legal contract behind it <laughs> that they know that nobody's gonna read whereas if you went into a shop you went yeah. to the supermarket and they said well, before you enter <laughs> like, please sign this 30 page contract yeah <laughs> you'd probably be like nah I, I'm not I'm not gonna shop there I'm gonna, yeah. gonna I'm gonna go to it's the green grocery down the road it's insane if you think about it it is yeah it's insane yeah yeah it is and it's very one-sided it's sort of like sign this or you can't come in um so what's so. the solution you're working on a solution um what is well, it <laughs> to say we're working on a solution might be overstating it but we're exploring what mm -hmm. alternatives might look like and i think i think there are like none of this is like necessary you know like we talked about kind of the early days of the web when it wasn't like this on the web. I think the early, you know, pioneers of the web, like Tim Berners-Lee, didn't envision it becoming yeah. like this. No. Um, so I think inherently, like the principle is that you could design and build digital services that don't treat people in this way and start by actually thinking about like how you serve their needs, what what's really going to be good for them as humans and do it on the principle like you would have done like any kind of good business in the past where it's like if we really serve people well they'll keep coming back rather than if we if we manipulate them and get them addicted um then they'll keep coming back um i do think that there's some challenges in that for certain types of business models where the business models are inherently based on that principle um you know some of the social media giants for example it's like that's that's what they're built upon but on the other hand I think the vision we're trying to create is that if we actually created beautiful online spaces that treat people well and that they love being in and where they can build real meaningful connections with other human beings or or have space to just explore and learn things and and enjoy things kind of on their own terms that okay they might not necessarily like be able to compete head to head with like Facebook for example um <laughs> On, but they're not trying to compete directly with Facebook. They're giving people an alternative. They're giving people a choice. It's like, you know, go and spend your time here because it respects you and it's a great place to be rather than go over there where you're being exploited. Um, so, yeah, it's so like we're, we're not, I don't think we're ever going to be in a position where we can say like, hey, look, we've got the solution. But I think we can like help with that conversation of exploring the principles and trying to embed them into some of our own work and trying to like, you know, experiment with them and see what works and see what doesn't. And don't you think that change is going to come from bottom up, uh, not from the big ones, you know, that they're yeah. not going to change anything because their model works. It's exactly. based on scarcity uh, and addiction, like you said. And so why would they change anything? Because the money keeps coming in. So they're not the ones who are going to change. It's it's the smaller ones. And also us the clients the customers who are just fed up uh with yeah. being abused and ma manipulated yeah exactly it's like the big tech companies have nothing they have nothing to gain and everything to lose by like doing things in a more humane way i think which is really sad and i think it's a kind of probably a reflection more of the broader mm -hmm. structure of our society and economy um but equally like we have a we do have a lot of personal like power over our own destiny like we're not actually like hooked into any of these things like we can choose to go wherever we want on the internet and um mm. and i think if people offer really humane alternatives then hopefully like a growing kind of number of people will start looking at those and thinking yeah okay this feels like a better place to be totally and, and i think what i've actually seen in the marketing world is that so even small uh, companies, one person companies, entrepreneurs, since the only models we had were the big tech companies and the, you know, the, the ones that are basically manipulating everybody, this became the going model. Everybody yeah. started using, even on the very small business level, using the same kind of, uh, you know, scarcity and, and manipulative approaches. Yeah. So over the last 20 years, um, 
this just became the norm, right? That yeah. it, it was just a given if you were in business, that's the way you had to market and and, and use technology and, and, and all of that. And all actually all the tech that I'm using in my business, you know, where I'm trying so hard to create a humane business, the tech, uh, so I'm talking like shopping carts or, or e-learning programs, it's all built on non-humane uh, principles. It's all yeah. built on the idea, let's get as many people in and sell them more crap. Basically. Yeah, basically. <laughs> and, it's, and it's just really hard to actually use technology and yet doing in a doing it in a humane way. It's, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's really, really hard. I think one of the sort of, I guess, sort of classically, one of the 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 alternatives to that kind of hyper commercial model has in the in the digital space has been the open source world which is mm -hmm. you know people building things with people for the people um and largely giving them away for free so that everybody can benefit from them and i think that is probably where like the solutions will come from um mm -hmm. but it, but as you sort of highlighted like even some of those things have gone more in that kind of commercial direction just because that's the way things are done and and some of those open source projects as brilliant as they might be have some sort of like commercial affiliation that sort of funds some of that community work and so the way that the projects are led has a bias towards like feeding that like kind of parent company or um whatever it might be right but but i do think like that the in in principle the sort of the open source world is probably like the best um place to to get like a groundswell of um kind of bottom up change i agree because it's also you know it's the people with the same values who come to create the solution and just give and you know know and trust and somewhere the money will come from but it yeah. doesn't mean that i have to exploit um uh, clients or or potential uh, customers yeah exactly yeah so so far we've talked about basically uh the win win of the the client and the seller right um it, what I talk about and also what you were talking about is also a, a third win, which is the win for the planet. Yeah. Um, so talk to us how a humane web, and then maybe you can also talk a little bit about um, web design, because that's also uh, part of your expertise. Where is the planet stand right now? And how do we make it a winner as well in this equation? Yeah, so the the environmental aspect is something that's sort of i think been left out of the conversation in the digital world largely until quite recently and and i think that's probably for a variety of reasons partly because digital technology is relative relatively new in terms of its impact on our lives um but also because a lot of the environmental impact is sort of out of sight and out of mind um you don't have like a chimney or an exhaust pipe on your computer and you know <laughs> it's sort of it, it's a lot of it's behind the scenes and we use terms like virtual um and the cloud as if like the internet doesn't really exist but it it is a huge physical system you know telecoms networks that span the entire planet um satellites in space like thousands of huge data centers around the world billions of devices connected to the networks so if you take it as one big machine, it is the biggest machine that humans have ever created. And and it consumes a huge amount of electricity, you know, roughly the amount of electricity is the whole of the United Kingdom. Um, if you took it as one thing, and the United Kingdom is like kind of one of the 10 biggest economies in the world. So that's that's pretty crazy when you think about it. And when you, uh, when you put that in terms of carbon emissions, which is essentially the emissions of producing all of that energy, um it's it's estimated generally somewhere between two and four percent of global carbon emissions which is a lot because like aviation which a lot of people think you know aviation is a serious problem which it is aviation is about two percent of global carbon emissions global shipping is about two percent um 
I think steel is about steel production is about 7%. So when you put, you know, put that in context of basically the internet being somewhere in the range of two to 4% um, and growing rapidly, especially with like the advent of, of, of AI and machine learning. Um, it's, it's something that needs to be talked about. Um, and it hasn't really been talked about much until like the last two, three years, really. Yeah, that's completely how I feel. I feel like <laughs> this has just, yeah, probably emerged three years ago for me or before I was like, well, I'm a virtual you know, business owner, so I don't create any any kind of problems. And, and then starting to realize, okay, so, you know, there's all these different players that actually do uh, impact how much carbon emissions I have. And and you know this was a, a whole transition, switching to a, a green or a greener host, and and like making my website lighter and still working on that. It's it's like things that you never think about. Just uploading you know two megabyte pictures on yeah. your website, and then when you start to realize, wait a minute, they have to be hosted somewhere, and the, and the server obviously runs on electricity. So every time, you know, this this is creating carbon emissions. So, so yeah, tell us about ethical, um, you know, web design. Like, what what does that kind of just maybe a few really pragmatic tips that people can do right now to, yeah, work on their website on, or at least become aware of that. Yeah. You mean specifically from the environmental perspective? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that the, the way I find most helpful to think about it is that there's, there's a lot of waste on the internet um, and, and waste isn't good for anybody, like any form of waste. And, but specifically in the internet, that waste generally is, if you're wasting data, then you're wasting, you're wasting energy, um, which is bad for the environment, but it also has other you know, kind of commercial impacts and user experience impacts and so on. But that waste can come in a number of forms. Like, first of all, like you just mentioned, you know, like having files that are just unnecessarily large, like image files, video files that are either like, maybe they're not required at all, but even if they are required, maybe they're um, just larger than they need to be. Maybe they're, um, they're not optimized well. Maybe they're not in like the most efficient file format. Um, so looking at things like that um things like tracking scripts tracking scripts can like be more they can use up more data sometimes than like an entire the actual web page that you see the stuff behind the scenes and this comes into like the humane aspect as well the stuff behind the scenes that's like harvesting all of your data um mm. there can actually be more code in there than there is in the actual like visible web page that you're viewing so you mean like facebook pixel tracking that kind of stuff yeah, all that kind of stuff, all that kind of like mm -hmm. ad personalizations, advert, you know, advertising scripts and, mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. And 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 that's I, I think that's kind of an interesting one to think about because it's it's using energy in a number of places and not for your benefit. So you've got basically like the advertising scripts have to be stored somewhere like in a data center. Then they have to be sent over the internet, which uses energy to get to you. Um, then they use energy on your device, which is your electricity that you paid for um, <laughs> to like spy on you or manipulate you by like, you know, manipulating the content. Um, and then they take the data they've, they've, they've harvested about you and then use more energy to ship it back over the internet where it gets stored and analyzed in a data center. Um, so, so like things like that, where there's like, I mean, the things like that, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a relationship between the environmental and this like human aspect. But I think if you're designing something, actually being really mindful about tracking scripts is really important because sometimes a lot of websites aren't even necessarily doing it for good reasons. It's just like, oh, I've got a website, so I'll stick Google Analytics on it. Um, and Google's really benefiting from that by getting all of that data, but you might not even, some people don't even really look at that data. So I think things like that are good to think about. Also from the environmental point of view, like where you host your website, you mentioned moving your website to a hosting provider that has a commitment to powering their data centers with renewable energy. That's kind of a, 
I'm not going to say it's an easy win because it depends whether like how easy you find it to actually migrate your website but um usually they really help you with that yeah they normally it will help you like do the migration so it can be it can be a low-hanging fruit to reduce the environmental impact um mm -hmm. and I think just from a content creation point of view just sort of being mindful about um like creating easy user journeys for people so they can find what they're looking for easily not creating unnecessary content um just for the sake of like search engines for example but actually making sure that your content is really tailored to humans and 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 you're not doing things like putting in images of like just um, like stock photography of people pointing at a whiteboard because you feel like you need to fill a space on the page you know just be really mindful about like justifying the existence of everything um if mm. you can justify why it's there then you know great um but if you can't then um obviously if in doubt leave it out um it's sort of a simple mantra for identifying and eliminating waste it's so interesting because basically also here you're saying let's go back to simplicity and, and mm. basics and you know, simple design rather than cluttered and obnoxious, you know, too much yeah. content design. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's e just sort of, again, going back to the human perspective, that can be much easier on the mind as well. Yeah. Um, it's relaxing. It's more relaxing, right? Than, yeah, having yeah. so much content on it on the, all the time. Exactly. I think, you know, there's a lot of problems with just sort of overstimulation. Um, on the internet so so i think that there's a the, again another synergy between sort of designing for the environment and designing for humans there yeah you uh, just a minute ago you you kind of addressed ai and and i um there's another great article that you actually published with a conversation between you and chat gpt about um the impact of AI uh, to the environment and, and social uh, impact and all of that. Um, yeah, tell us a little bit about that uh, and just in general, how AI impacts all of what we just discussed. Yeah, so it was, <laughs> I thought it would be really interesting just to sort of ask an AI about the potential risks of AI and see <laughs> to see what it came back with um i thought maybe i'll learn something maybe it will teach me something i don't know um maybe it will be biased um, um i was actually like sort of pleasantly surprised that its answers seemed quite thorough and quite quite honest um in identifying that there is like potentially a huge energy cost to ai in terms of just how much computing um power it needs um, both to train the models and run the models. Um, mm. I think it gave me a figure of to train GPT-3 required, I think, 500 CPU years, which is effectively like running a CPU, running a running a computer for 500 years to train <sighs> one model. Um, so it was, it was quite honest in, in that. It did also highlight that there's potential benefits um, from an environmental point of view, if you can use that AI then to help humanity solve environmental problems and make other things more efficient which i think is absolutely true um but it also highlighted that the flip side of that is that it's all about what we choose to do with it like you could choose to use ai to like to to extract more fossil fuels from from the ground which is what the fossil fuel companies are using it for um and in fact there was a big conference i think run by amazon um specifically about that like inviting all the fossil fuel companies to <laughs> to see what how they could how they could like find discover and extract more oil um wow. so so that that's kind of interesting that it, it like chat gpt itself highlighted that um but then it also like i asked it about sort of social impacts and it did it did sort of quite honestly like explain that like yeah there's potential risk to people's jobs um in terms of being replaced by ai there's risks of bias there's risks of um uh, big temp big tech companies um having more and more power because essentially like whoever has control of the ai has more power over society and the, and the potential to like manipulate 
public opinion and and potentially even influence democracy, which is something that it did bring up. So, um, yeah, I think it was quite well rounded. I felt in terms of what it highlighted. And of course, it's not really a, it's not a person, <laughs> and that's the thing that it's like really hard to like get your head around when you start doing something like trying to have a conversation with it. It's like well, hard to like my... it or dislike it. <laughs> you know? Yeah, right. I I've, I've set myself a rule that I'm like when if I did you know like when I did that to not say thank you because <laughs> it sounds really simple but as soon as but you ask a question and you get an answer back that sounds like a human wrote you a message back right. and it's really easy to slip into that thing of thinking there's a person on the other side when there's not um <laughs> and I don't know if you've seen the film Ex Machina um I haven't it, it's it, I mean I think it's I only watched it earlier this year because it sort of felt like this is the time in history where the science fiction is suddenly catching up <laughs> yeah like like real life is mirroring science fiction and yeah it's it's a film about and like an, an ai that's been developed and um and humans building relationships with it and the, and the boundaries between what's human and what's not being blurred mm -hmm. and how that that's a slippery slope basically um I won't spoil it for you but <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> but uh, and, uh, yeah it's a I I it's a it's a fascinating and very well made film um mm -hmm. on this topic yeah I'll look it up and I'll definitely link to to that article the interview with um chat GPT um as we're kind of coming to a close here I, I'm I'm just I always feel like, oh, so it's such a heavy topic, right? And um, when we started recording um, offline, I told you I tried just to focus on the positive things. So let's let's do that here as well. How do you see the future of humane web, and and what can we do to, you know, kind of counter effect the big tech and the big companies and and even if it's just in our own little bubble, but at least we're creating that vision and who knows what will come out of it, but at least we're living in that vision already. What can we do? And and then, yeah, uh, from there, how do you see it evolve? Yeah, sure. I, I think the main thing we can do is, first, first of all, like stop and think about like what we what we need as humans and how the technology can serve us rather than the standard model now, which is sort of like, how do, how do we serve the technology? Um, and you, you know, you spoke about it earlier about how we go down this route of like, now there's a, like an established model of like how the internet works and how the business models on the internet work being like those of big tech companies. And so there's just a natural inclination to mirror that and just copy it and I think the the best thing we can do is actually just stop and think look inside ourselves about like what would it look like if it was really serving my needs and serving the needs of of others and mm -hmm. actually just have the confidence to try to do things differently and not just copy the kind of the standard template of how things are done these days um, and I think if more and more people do that and and importantly more and more people share that and tell the story of how they're thinking about it and why they're doing things differently um i think that's really powerful because it, it can create a sort of like ground up change um both in the, the way that people are thinking about the internet as well as the way that people are interacting with it yeah 100 percent, and and that's definitely what we're trying to do here and i know you are as well and and you might think because what we're seeing is the big tech everywhere, right? Mm. But the more you kind of are in these circles, the more other little circles you discover and you're like, wow, there's actually people like us everywhere. Yeah, so that exactly. always gives me hope. I'm like, well, two years ago, I didn't know about Tom Greenwood. And now I know that you've been working on this for years and years. And so, you know, there's, there's millions of us and that, that, gives me hope so I, I I couldn't agree more with you to just kind of 
you said stop and um, kind of step into the confidence of doing things differently. And I think yeah. that is key because it is scary to, you know, not do what everybody else is doing. Um, so, yeah, if even if it's just, you know, for your website and that's where, again, uh, I'm going to go back to my website and, and check that I don't have any kind of tracking code in there because yeah, I don't need it, right? So um, definitely a yeah to start exactly. Start from where you are and 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 ask yourself questions about like what it is that you're doing. If you're creating things on the internet, um, and and just see where it see where it leads. See what other people are doing. Yeah. Um, I mean, even on the tracking script one, like there are alternatives. Like there's one called Plausible, for example, um, which is like it gives you some data about how like how many people are using your website what like what countries they come from what web browsers they use what pages they visit but it's completely anonymized it's very very lightweight energy efficient um script so there are some like kind of there are alternatives to some of these like big tech solutions that are actually trying to balance the sort of the human and the environmental side as well as providing some useful functionality for when people do need it um yeah so yeah it's worth looking for those as well thank you i i would really encourage listeners also to sign up to your newsletter so please share with us where people can find you and your newsletter and all your other good work yeah sure so the newsletter i'm, I'm very excited this um just passed six thousand subscribers yesterday um mm -hmm. it's it's called curiously green um, if you Google Curiously Green newsletter, you, sh you should find it. Um, and, and it's basically a monthly newsletter about like greening the internet, um, but in a very holistic way. So, you know, we talk about things like Humane Web as well. Um, and we started it about three years ago thinking that nobody would be interested. <laughs> so it's just suddenly like now be like, oh, wow, there's like 6,000 people subscribe to this. That for me is like a source of optimism. Again, um, that th that means that there's all these people everywhere, right? And saying, yeah, me too. I'm exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. But the, like, I think sometimes we, we don't realize that there's a lot of people out there that are thinking like we're thinking or, or maybe they're thinking differently from we're thinking, but they're like, they really care about making things better. Um, and we just don't know that they're out, they're out there. Um, right. So when we have things that kind of bring these voices together, I think that's really powerful. Mm. Um, so yeah, so the Curiously Green newsletter, um, I mean, you can find me on LinkedIn. That's Tom Greenwood, who runs Whole Grain Digital. There's lots of Tom Greenwoods, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm that one. <laughs> um, and I also have a, um, I also have a, a personal newsletter about sustainable business on Substack called Oxymoron, um, which you can look up on Substack um yeah so i guess they're the they're the, they're the key places to find me and you have a book right i do have a book yeah yeah i always forget to mention that yeah so. there you go <laughs> <laughs> so i always have a book um about sustainable web design called sustainable web design um you can you can get it direct from the publisher uh which is a book apart.com or it's now available as of about two weeks ago in a lot of bookshops um so you can find it on amazon and other kind of online bookstores as well wonderful thank you so much for sharing that i always ask one last question here to every uh guest and that is what are you grateful for today this week this season to be honest i i am grateful for the fact that like we live in a world where we can have these sorts of conversations you know like we have the freedom to think and and share ideas and you know, even if not everything is perfect and not everything's always trending in the direction we want it to, like the fact that we have the opportunity to try and like do something about it and connect with with other people trying to do so is 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 a wonderful thing, um, which I'm very grateful for. Yeah, I agree, and I'm grateful for the work you're doing and and your team. So, thank you. Let's keep it up. Yeah. Thanks so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for being here, Tom. Thanks so much for watching and being part of a generation of marketers who cares for yourself, for your clients, and for the planet. We really are change makers before we are marketers. 
So go ahead, be the change you want to see in the world. And I hope to see you again next week. Take care.